love you. Backstabbing, harassment, slander. These days, it's every girl for herself. It's it's scary. It's getting worse. People are getting meaner. <laughs> Girls try to ruin each other's lives for kind of no reason. The movie Mean Girls turned the spotlight on the nasty truth. I have really bad breath in the morning. I wanted to kind of have people feel the pimples. Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. Off camera, the drama really heated up. We thought, well, oh my god, what's going to happen? Is this going to be the beginning of something? There was all that comedy, but underneath it all was this bitch. She's a scum-sucking road horse. She ruined my life. And the bad behavior spilled over into headlines. It wasn't pretty. Mother... Get ready to go ringside. This is the greatest cat fight in cinematic history. Can, can you pick me up? I'm scared. This is the story of Mean Girls, the E! True Hollywood story. Girls and women, sometimes we're our own worst enemies. And shove it right up your hairy... There are a lot of mean girls in Hollywood. And tabloids survive on girl fights. There has to be some sort of an ongoing feud. In recent years, celebrity girl fights featured some of the hottest names on the young Hollywood A-list. Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie made headlines with their feud. The Simple Lifers made even more news when they buried the hatchet. Those people are old enough to realize that they're making a choice about making those kinds of arguments public. You do have choices about how you present yourself to the media. I think Paris and Nicole's big fight was just orchestrated so they could make up and it would be a big, fabulous news story. <laughs> but one of the most notorious girl squabbles began in 2003. Lindsay Lohan and Hilary Duff faced off in the media after finding out that they both dated the same guy. Lindsay picked a fight with Hilary Duff over Aaron Carter. It wasn't pretty. I know that Lindsay was really upset that he had started dating her and then there was conflict. In April, tension broke out between the two teens during a magazine photo session in Los Angeles. When Lindsay was doing the Vanity Fair shoot, she was really excited about it because it was about her you know, on the rise with all of these other young girl stars. So she was all amped, and then Hillary showed up with Aaron. So it kind of put a damper on the shoot. More boy drama followed at the premiere of Lowen's hit movie, Freaky Friday. Lindsay was co-starring in a movie with Chad Michael Murray, and yeah. Hillary had showed up at that premiere with Chad because they were in the midst of doing the movie Cinderella Story. So he thought it was a good way for them to get acquainted and not thinking anything bad would occur, but Lindsay got upset about it. According to newspaper reports, at the premiere of Hilary Duff's movie, Cheaper by the Dozen, Duff's camp reportedly demanded Lowen leave. Lindsay refused. Overnight, Hollywood was buzzing. People saying that they didn't like each other and they were saying bad things about each other. In February 2004, Lindsay declared a truce with Hillary. Meanwhile, in an example of art imitating life, Lindsay was in the midst of a new project called Mean Girls. The movie depicted the hazards of high school politics. I don't think anyone escapes the horror they feel at being ostracized by a group of teenage girls. And I don't care how popular you were, at some point, you were the target. The film was inspired by an article highlighting author Rosalind Wiseman's book, Queen Bees and Wannabes. The New York Times Sunday Magazine did a cover story on girls being mean to each other, and I was profiled in the story. People knew the girls were mean to each other, but I think the story really brought it alive. Right, people were like, oh my gosh, girls are horrible. <laughs> Come on. We're doing interviews in here. Saturday Night Live star Tina Fey pounced on the piece. Girls try to ruin each other's lives for kind of no reason other than, you know, maybe jealousy or sport. And so I just really thought that there was a lot to, to write about. 
Faith felt like the property was the perfect vehicle to jumpstart her career as a screenwriter. Tina approached her boss, Lorne Michaels, with the concept. In the past, the creator of Saturday Night Live helped many comedians get their movies off the ground. I thought, hmm, uh, it sounded like a good idea, and uh, we talked to the people at Paramount, and they were happy to buy a book that the article was based on. But Faye faced some stiff competition. It seemed every producer in Hollywood had the same idea. I started getting phone calls, a number of phone calls from people saying, we want to buy your life story, we want to, um, you know, turn this into something, TV or movie. It was horrifying to get these phone calls. Rosalind was in no hurry to sell, and she wasn't about to be pushed around. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just said, no, thanks, goodbye. Um, and I really had said no. It wasn't complicated, no, like, oh, should I do it, should I not do it? It was easy, easy, like, no way this person's really freaky, I'm not, no way. Then, the author heard about the girl from Saturday Night Live. I got a phone call from my agent saying that there's this woman named Tina Fey who's really interested in buying your book. And I didn't know who Tina was. Rosalind and Tina set up a phone meeting. And we hit it off. I mean, she was somebody, you know, when I talked to her within three minutes, I was like, oh, well, this is like a woman that I would work with. You know, we're friends. I promised her that I would not write a filthy, stupid, you know, um, teen comedy with her book. Faye beat out all of Hollywood for the rights to Wiseman's story. Now, all she had to do was write a script. There was just one problem. She, after the fact, <laughs> learned that, in fact, there was no narrative to this book. She was like, you did not know? She's like, I didn't really know that it was a nonfiction book. That whole book is a serious nonfiction book of about the, you know, what they call relational aggression among girls and the ways that girls mess with each other. <laughs> Coming up, turning bad behavior into gold. She was very smart, and she could also be uh, very dirty. <laughs> and later... I was really on edge all the time. So I need to watch your back. In 2002, Saturday Night Live comedian Tina Fey began writing her first screenplay, Mean Girls. She came up with a plot inspired by her own painful experiences. She was making a teenage comedy that was going to be about so much more than just teenage comedy. And it's not going for an easy joke, it's going for something uh, a little bit deeper. Fey was born in Darby, Pennsylvania in 1970. Growing up, Tina felt like she didn't fit in. I can remember being really intimidated by other girls and, and also the thing that I kind of had to own up to was that when I was in high school, I really did have a tendency to be kind of mean. I was a very jealous girl. So if I was jealous of another girl, I would be really mean about her and, you know, behind her back and make, you know, try to convince my friends not to be friends with her. And it's really bad, it's really bad behavior. Faye overcame her insecurities with humor. In 1988, the class clown enrolled in the theater department at the University of Virginia. After graduation, she made a beeline to Chicago to study improv at the Second City. You've got almost 1,500 students taking classes here every week. There's only so many spots available. The first time I met Tina was sitting out here in the audience auditioning Tina. From what I remember about her was how razor sharp her wit was. The aspiring performer was a standout in class. Then, in 1996, Faye landed a coveted spot in the Second City's traveling troupe. That's where she met Mr. Wright. Uh, Jeff was both a musical director and then, and then started directing touring companies when Tina first got on stage. And Jeff and Tina were a great couple because they were, they were both so smart and they were both so beloved and both so funny. They had such a great relationship together and they, if you've met Jeffrey he's a, he's a very lovable guy very funny guy so I think a lot of if there were any stresses back there I'm sure that they had that great ability to deal with it through you know being humorous meanwhile Tina was making her mark on audiences I remember seeing her when I was already at SNL she was in Second City and I went backstage and she was one of the first people I went up to and said you're really good after several years of proving herself on the improv circuit, Faye was ready for a new challenge. She wanted to write for Saturday Night Live, and Tina had an in. Adam McKay, 
who had been at Second City, he was had come here and was writing and was the head writer at that time. And I was ready to leave Second City, so I called him and said, uh, you know, how do I apply as a writer? Adam McKay asked Tina to submit a, a packet. We read her packet and it was really good, and then she came. In 1997, Faye left the Windy City and moved to Manhattan to begin her new gig. Tina's boyfriend, Jeff Richmond, followed soon after. We had a show and I got him into New York. And then I think there was a period where he was just working a little bit around town. And then eventually, I think Lauren picked him up and he became involved in SNL and the musical side. For the first time in her life, Tina fit right in. The thing that surprised people at SNL about Tina and really caught their attention was that her sketches were very smart and kind of risque. And she would sort of do topics that not a lot of, you wouldn't expect from a female writer. She was very smart and she could also be uh, very dirty. <laughs> and so uh, it was a really funny combination. And she had, she had a very specific viewpoint about material that she was doing. It was, it could be mean, it could be fresh. It was very much of a boys club over there. And I think what she was, she was able to break that because she has this sort of great skill with people. Tina's good with boys. I mean, you know, uh, boys are not intimidated by her and they want to be her friend. Uh, and she also isn't someone who uses her femaleness uh, as, as, a, as a weapon or tool. She is just Tina. Three seasons after joining the show, Faye got a surprise from executive producer Lauren Michaels. There's a way around here where you can get a promotion and not really know that it's happened. Because it's never really like, here's your promotion. It's sort of like, yeah, you might end up doing this. And I had a meeting with Lauren about it, and he's kind of like, well, you might do some more, we might need you to do this. And I actually came out at the meeting and I had to go to the other producers and say, did I, did you just, did you promote me? Did I, or did I, is my job changing? Like it was just not <laughs> clear. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're gonna, have, you're gonna be like a writing supervisor. Okay. Tina became the first female head writer in SNL history. I was, I was overwhelmed because I, it was only my, like third season here. I think it's the first time you walk into that room full of writers who are mostly guys and they're <laughs> older than me and like they're all like six foot two and uh, it's intimidating. Um, but you get used to it. Faye stayed active in the comedy scene. I was doing a, a show um, with Rachel Dratch, a two-woman show, um, and Lauren came and saw it. Michaels was impressed and decided to put Faye's talents to use on camera as well. And after he saw that show, he asked me if I wanted to test for update. And it was his idea from the beginning that he wanted Jimmy and I to do it together and test together. And I think everyone was, including me and Jimmy, was like, really? I don't, that's, really? Okay. But he thought that would be a good match. And so we tested twice, I think, once or twice together along with other people. And it ended up happening very last minute, about the week before the first show. In October 2000, Faye made her debut as co-anchor of SNL's Weekend Update with Jimmy Fallon. Tina and Jimmy are really good. She just goes for it, you know, hits it hard. It's so nice to see it. Jimmy's the best partner you could ever want, something like that. And we have our own little segment, and we just kind of, in our 10 minutes, kind of do whatever we want. Like, we tell jokes, but we also have weird guests come on, and it's really, really fun. Faye was also enjoying her personal life. The following summer, Tina married her longtime boyfriend, Jeff Richmond. I attended her wedding. We went, and you know, I, I met a very, you know, gregarious, you know, loving family when we went to that wedding. It was t fantastic. They were always going to get married. I mean, it was, you know, this is this was a couple that was meant to be together. By age 31, Faye had it made. Then the funny lady took her shot at Hollywood. After putting the finishing touches on her screenplay Mean Girls, Tina was ready to rock. So was Freaky Friday director Mark Waters. I actually saw a, a draft of Mean Girls that I wasn't supposed to see. It was before it was going to officially publish for the industry to read. And it's because my, my agent just slipped it to me. And it was actually the vulgar, R-rated, filled with cussing version of the script, which was which was hysterical and funny. And, and, and I thought, there's no way anybody's ever going to make this movie because it's so raunchy. But the director was hooked. He vowed to make Mean Girls his pet project. I just, I just pursued it and basically kind of like, you know, got Lauren and Tina in a room and wouldn't, wouldn't let them out until they agreed to let me direct it. And from the first moment that we met with him, I was like, oh, this guy's great. Waters won them over. Now all they had to do was find the perfect cast. 
that there are 99 speaking parts. So um, it was a little daunting. Coming up, hunting high and low. We had searched and searched for the lead and we couldn't find it. By summer 2003, Tina Fey roped in a major studio and a hot director to turn her first script into a movie hit. Finding the perfect cast was more complicated. We had just finished uh, shooting Freaky Friday. So the studio, Paramount, and the executive producer, Lauren Michaels, saw a Freaky Friday and fell in love with Lindsay and said, we have to have her in this movie. Lauren wasn't a household <laughs> name yet. But the 17-year-old native New Yorker was well on her way. Lindsay Morgan Lowen started modeling when she was three. Lindsay, I felt like, always wanted to, to be in front of the camera, always wanted to be the center of attention. As a child, Lindsay did 60 commercials. 60 is a huge number of commercials for anyone, even an adult, it's huge. In 1996, Lindsay landed a spot on the daytime drama Another World and a key role in the movie remake of The Parent Trap. But it was her next project that really pushed her over the top. I saw Lindsay in Freaky Friday, I was like, oh my God, we have to have this girl in the movie because she's such a good actress and she's so beautiful. Faye made sure Lindsay got a sneak peek at Mean Girls. I read the script before um, really anyone had read it and then I went to SNL one night and uh, I was there with like my publicist and she was like, you should go and tell Tina that you've read the script and I was like, no, I don't want to, I'm kind of scared, I don't want to like be weird or anything and she was like, no, go tell her. So I went up to her and I was like, I just read your script and she was like, oh my God, you did? And she was like, really flattered, I guess. Lindsay was a shoe in but for which part? Katie, the new girl in town or Regina, the reigning bitch? Some that thought that she should play Katie, and, and some of us that thought she should play Regina. And she wanted to play Katie, and we kind of slowly talked her into playing Regina. Producers continued searching for a fresh ingenue. Well, we read Rachel McAdams for the part of Katie, and I had never met her before. I had seen her in um, The Hot Chick, and I heard she was in The Notebook, which hadn't come out yet, and was phenomenal in this movie. She came in and read for us for Katie and I was blown away. I told the director, this girl is a movie star. Rachel McAdams was born on October 10th, 1976 in London, Ontario, Canada. By the time she turned 12, McAdams knew acting was her passion. I just enjoyed it. As soon as I started doing it, it just, it fulfilled something in me and um, yeah, I'm so lucky that I found it. At York University in Toronto, Rachel majored in theater. I saw her, uh, I guess, in her second year. And the first thing, you know, that struck me was that you found yourself sort of unable to watch some of the other people in the room. She glows. She, she sparkles. There's something light and airy and yet stunningly beautiful. When she came into fourth year, I cast her in the lead of the play. The agents all come up to take a look at it, and they went wild over Rachel. She got herself a very good agent. After graduation, McAdams' hard work paid off. In 1998, she landed her first professional gig on the Disney television series, The Famous Jet Jackson. An MTV pilot followed. Then, Rachel made the jump to the big screen. I mean, Hot Chick was her break. It totally put her into limelight. There was no doubt she was beautiful. There was no doubt she was magnetic. There was no doubt she could act. Rachel was on a roll, beating out a string of A-list actresses for the lead in the romance The Notebook, opposite Ryan Gosling. But McAdams still felt like a fish out of water. Being a newcomer and, and no one knowing who I was or, you know, and then all of a sudden to be, you know, do, doing this role in this big film, it was a little daunting at first. But Hollywood embraced McAdams even before the movie was released. Doors flew open for bigger auditions, including one for Mean Girls. We had searched and searched for the lead, and we couldn't find it. Everybody seemed too weak or too young, and so we, we were kind of agonizing over it. Rachel McAdams came in to read for Katie. After the audition was over, I said, wow, you're like too old to play this part, but you're like, I think you might be a movie star. 
Over the course of the next several weeks, I just kept watching her audition and I couldn't let go of it. And I talked to the director and I said, we should have her play Regina. We thought, you know what, if Lindsay played Katie and she played Regina, because Regina had to feel like she was the senior, kind of the old one and the one who was like more, more you know, uh, experienced. Lindsay was kind of a little bit awed by her, you know, in, during the audition. And I thought like, oh, that's good. That, that would be a good feeling for the movie. Lindsay agreed to trade parts. Now all producers had to do was cast the rest of the high school clique known as the Plastics. 17-year-old soap actress Amanda Zeifried was all set to attend Fordham University in Manhattan. But an audition for Mean Girls put her education on hold. We were having a tough time finding somebody to play Karen. We realized, wait, you know, this girl was so good, maybe she could play dumb. People think it's really easy to play a dumb blonde. You just get a dumb blonde. But that's really not the way it works. You have to have somebody who has comedy chops and who's very smart and knows where to put the joke. The team had a tougher time finding the right girl to play people pleaser Gretchen. We saw actresses from all over the country. This part took some serious comedy timing. This girl was like a wounded little puppy, but is just trying to break through and be part of the pack. The director and crew had already gone off to location and we were supposed to start shooting in a few weeks and I'm still auditioning girls. At the last minute, Lacey Chabert nailed it. Lacey came in one day and read the scene for the first time and immediately got it, just like that. And it was the first time that I'd seen the scene read perfectly and exactly what I had in my head. And I had her do it again just to be sure and we sent it off to the director and I called him that night and I said, we found her. There was really nobody else who was good enough to play Gretchen besides Lacey Chabert. We didn't test anybody else. Lacey Nicole Chabert was born in Purvis, Mississippi on September 30th, 1982. She was a performer from the get-go. When I was four years old, I started taking voice lessons because I just wanted to sing. In 1991, Lacey tested her pipes on the TV talent show, Star Search. Ah! <laughs> oh gosh, the hill! But her big break came by accident in New York City. It's a really strange story, like on a family vacation, and I happened to audition for Les Miserables. You know, we were there seeing the theater and the art and stuff. And I auditioned for Les Mis and begged my parents, just for the heck of it, let me just see what an audition is. And I actually got it. <laughs> for two years, Chabert played the role of Cosette in the Tony Award-winning musical. La, 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 something like that. The Broadway stage was the perfect place to get noticed. You know, one thing went to another and I did party five. As young Claudia on the hit family drama, Lacey became a TV star. It's kind of weird when out of the blue someone like knows your name, the stranger, and but it's it's really neat. I think it's fun to meet fans. By the time Mean Girls came her way six years later, Chabert was primed. It really prepared her. She knew from the shorthand of my direction and her understanding of reading the material what I was going for, and she was able to take it all in and just deliver. With the plastics in place, casting directors focused on the adults, with a little help from screenwriter Tina Fey. The other fun thing about the casting was knowing that I had the Saturday Night Live bench behind me. Tried and true comedians like Tim Meadows and Amy Poehler and Anna Gasteyer and Neil Flynn, uh, who played the dad. I saw Lauren Michaels at a wedding, and he said, that this script Tina wrote, and there's a really funny part in it for you. And then as I read the script, it was sort of obvious to me that she tailored it for the kind of stuff that I do that makes her laugh. Meadows said yes to the role of the out there high school principal. Amy Poehler and Anna Gasteyer signed on as the suburban moms, and Tina Fey even wrote a part for herself. I play a calculus teacher and I'm having kind of a crap year. I'm going through a divorce and I'm working like three jobs and, and these girls, you know, they make my year a little bit harder with their behavior, but um, I'm kind of the voice of reason. Still, the casting process seemed endless. Just the scope of it, it was large. There were so many parts and each one was such a specific character. We were casting uh, the role of Aaron, the hot guy, the boyfriend. And this guy came in and read, and I thought he was really hot. And he left the room, and Mark Waters said, nah, no. And, and all, all those girls went, what 
are you kidding? And he goes, no, no, he's not right. And then, and then Tina says, well, the vaginas think that he's very hot. Jonathan Bennett made an impression on the women, but the director still wanted a second opinion. I basically kind of took all the audition tapes and played them for my young assistants and every other like girl who was in, who was in their 20s in my office. And he came on screen, everyone kind of sat up and they're like, oh, he works. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he's good. You know, and then I was like, okay, fine. Plus, he was the one that Lindsay, when he saw the audition tape, was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think, it, I think he's going to work too. Bennett was in. But there was one more guy to cast. Daniel Francesi was desperate to play nerdy art student Damien. Easier said than done. We auditioned tons of people. Nobody felt like they were good enough. And even Daniel's audition wasn't very good. And it just so happened that, like, when he auditioned, though, he was in the waiting room and while Tina and I were waiting. And we just ended up talking to him and thinking, like, this guy's really great. Waters invited Daniel to a table read. The young actor wasn't about to blow his second shot at the job. And he ended up just, like, just destroying in the room. And even Lorne was, like, spitting up his water laughing. And he did nothing but hit home runs every single line he had. And we so, so he kind of won the part at the last minute that way. When actress Lizzie Kaplan signed on as Daniel's artsy counterpart, casting was finally complete. She walked in, and we, we was just, you know, OK, Mealy, she's got the part. Mean Girls was ready to roll. Casting is like putting together the perfect dinner party and you want to have all the right people at the table, you also have to make sure you have all the right people sitting next to each other, which is really important so that they can play off of each other. Coming up, absolute pandemonium. This is the greatest cat fight in cinematic history. And later... There was all that comedy, but underneath it all was this bitch. In September 2003, Mean Girls began shooting in Toronto. Director Mark Waters and star Lindsay Lohan were on a roll. Their first film together, Freaky Friday, grossed more than $100 million at the box office. Lohan was Hollywood's golden child. She really has a range as an actress. She's so likable on screen that you just really identify with her. She had just received a huge check, a big bonus. A million dollar bonus, to be exact for a job well done. 17-year-old Lindsay was famous and rich, but Mean Girls didn't go without a hitch. On day one of filming, Lowen refused to come out of her trailer. Lindsay did develop some sort of eye infection or something, so we weren't able to shoot with Lindsay on day one. And we thought, well, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Is this gonna be the beginning of something? The director had a heart-to-heart -heart with his leading lady. I'm very demanding with her, you know, about what I, like, what, what I think is going to be adequate to make her great in the movie, and she's, you know, kind of challenged by it. Lowen got down to business. You know, we were working really long hours, but basically it's, it's, not, it's not like she had, like, a party scene to go to. You're stuck in Toronto, you know, in, in, in the cold. She was, she was really great. She could be finishing a conversation, and as soon as the camera was rolling, she was right there. Lindsay played Katie, the naive outsider who sells her soul to get in with the A-list at her new high school. She goes from a complete innocent to the other end of the spectrum to being a complete villain, basically, and then kind of finding her way back. Because being with the plastics was like being famous. People looked at you all the time, and everybody just knew stuff about you. Every actress on set could identify with Katie's plight. I've been in that place where my, my best friends have treated me kind of cruel. And, you know, it's been really, it was really sad. It made me cry a lot, and I felt really insecure. And girls spreading rumors about you, yeah. saying things that weren't true, and then that takes on a life of its own. And you see a lot of that in the movie. It's very lifelike. And not knowing why people are mad at you. What did I do? What, oh my god, I can't remember. I can't remember doing anything, but obviously I did something because they're really mad. <laughs> no, you're so right. You know, and you just start to spin and you get really paranoid and mm -hmm. can't relax. I was really on edge true. all the time. You sort right, of me too. watch your back. It always feels like someone's out to get you. Rachel McAdams had to dig deep to play Regina, the avenging leader of the popular clique. 
she is just the nicest person imaginable. So for her to kind of get down and get into the mean, it was a bit of a struggle for her at first, and I had to push her buttons a little bit and get her in touch with that rage and that part of her that's a bit of a predator. Once she kind of embraced that, she killed him apart. Oh my God. I love your skirt. Where did you get it? Uh, it was my mom's in the 80s. <gasps> Vintage. So adorable. Thanks. <laughs> That is the ugliest skirt I've ever seen. I mean, there was all that comedy, but underneath it all was this bitch, you know? With the girls turning in stellar performances, Mark Waters focused on the details. And I wanted to kind of have people feel the pimples and feel like if they're, that they're actually in a real high school watching this scene play out. Creating high school situations and trying to you know, make it so that it was believable and that people could think that, oh yeah, that's what my high school is like. Tina Fey was always on hand to keep the humor fresh. We were working it hand in hand about all the time. I felt blessed that I had like the best punch up writer in the business, kind of in a captive audience actually sitting on my set with me all the time. Because if I had any questions about the script, we could talk about it and vice versa with her. So it was kind of convenient. And all during production, if we felt like something wasn't working, even if it was in the middle of shooting it, we would be brainstorming ideas and saying, hey, let's try some other way to make this funny. Faye helped guide actor Rajiv Surendra. Right before we shot the rap, she said, okay, let's go over this. Where is this guy coming from? He's very, very angry, and I want you to just get all that anger and frustration out. The chat worked, and the sequence became a classic. Oh, you suck at MCs, ain't got nothing on me. From my grades to my lines, you can't touch Kevin G. I'm a mathlete, but I'm Kevin a poor. The G is silent when I sneak in your door and make love to your woman on the bathroom floor. I don't play it like Shaggy, you'll know it was me, because the next time you see her, she would be like, oh, Kevin G. That's the rap. Thank you, Kevin, that's enough. Happy holidays, everybody. The SNL contingent in the cast added the comedic punch. Amy Poehler, Anna Gasteyer, Tim Meadows, and my friend Neil Flynn made me feel really comfortable. Because I knew if I wasn't on the set, they would do all their bits right, because I know they're all really funny. I just knew we could kind of count on them for comedy without them having to strain for it. The newcomers were thrilled to be working with their TV idols. Having Tina Fey like be in the scene with you, and then all the cast of SNL at the same time be around you, it was very weird. It's you're pinching yourself the whole time. To work with like a bunch of the cast of Saturday Night Live is a lot of fun, and actors' dreams like to do that because um, you learn from them and you get a lot of comedic insight from them and stuff. And one of the the funniest people on set was Amy Poehler, who played Regina George's mom. She would just do tiny things while we were shooting too. Like she does things with her eyes, where she'll she'll pop her eyes or she'll she'll, she'll they'll start to close very slowly, like she's drunk or something. I just want you to know, if you need anything, don't be shy, okay? There are no rules in this house. I'm not like a regular mom. I'm a cool mom, <laughs> right, Regina? Please stop talking. Okay, I'm gonna make you girls a hump day treat. I couldn't hold a straight face when Amy was working. Sometimes I couldn't do it. Tim Meadows didn't make it any easier. Lindsay and I had to be really serious when we were walking into the room. But I kept teasing her right before the camera would roll and making her laugh. And so there was a few takes where she'd walk in and then she would just start laughing. And she would just tell Mark, hey, Tim's messing with me outside. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm not doing nothing. I'm not doing anything. I don't know what's wrong with her. On set and off, the generation gap vanished. Everyone was so cool. When we ate lunch, we all ate lunch together, and it was it was uh, like this big camaraderie. What's up? We would all go out to dinners and go see movies, and we had girls' nights in each other's hotel rooms and stuff, so it was fun. And actually, I took them all to see Chris Rock one night. It didn't dawn on me until later that Chris Rock's show is like a already show, and all these girls are like, you know, 16 to like 18. <laughs> Chris, I'd like you to meet my friends. These uh, girls I'm working with, they're all teenagers. I was a bit apprehensive thinking, geez, all these girls around and they're all good looking and they're all going to be divas and they're, they're all going to be worrying about what they look like. And they weren't. The guys were more concerned about what they looked like. I never felt so old in my whole life. I'd never been around teenage girls for like, you know, a month. It was a very surreal experience showing up to set and having, you know, Lindsay Lohan and Rachel McAdams and Lacey Chabert and Amanda Seyfried and having the whole plastics, you know, not only there but drooling over you. Why do you wear your hair like that? Your hair looks so sexy, pushed back. But the guys kept it professional at all times. We had to get a lot done 
because of the laws of working with kids. Tougher than dealing with labor laws was staging the climactic high school riot scene without getting anyone hurt. When the kids go berserk and start attacking each other and uh, after they've read about the burn book and how they're all involved in it was, uh, it was a bit of a deal. 200 extras fighting. We were mixing in stunt women with the cast fighting, having them like diving off the stairs and all this stuff. And so it was very well choreographed. It took a long time to shoot. And then, of course, to soak everybody down made it for a bit of a tough bit of production. Whoa! Hell no! I did not leave the South Side for this! This is the greatest cat fight in cinematic history. After an intense eight-week shoot, Mean Girls was finally in the can. I shove it right up your hairy I actually felt like we had gotten the movie. You know, I felt like we had nailed it. You know, and then, if anything, I immediately got stressed because we decided to accelerate the release date of the movie. Coming up, Hollywood Mean Girls. Lindsay and Paris both have to make out with each other's ex-boyfriend. Mean Girls premiered on April 19, 2004. The brutal teen comedy struck a chord with audiences. I was wondering, you know, how it would do. And then it came out, and it was number one. Um, it's opening weekend, and it's done so well. The film quickly earned more than $100 million at the box office. That it's a special moment in time when the synchronicity of your movie and the marketplace meet. You've got to really just stand back and, and enjoy it. No one appreciated the moment more than Lindsay Lohan. Overnight, Lindsay shed her tween image and became the latest It Girl. Once Mean Girls actually came out and was a success, and it was kind of like her big front and center on the poster, and from that point on, that was when I would say that kind of like her world changed in a way that, that was irrevocable. The laugh out loud cautionary tale also changed the way many teenagers viewed themselves. Younger girls in particular laugh at the movie, but they think it's kind of like a reality show. They're like horrified. They spend as much, ga much time gasping as they do laughing. I'm sorry that people are so jealous of me, but I can't help it that I'm popular. I hope that in a way it like showed girls how they act in cliques and how they can be mean to each other and, um, and maybe it would make a change, you know, maybe you know, when you see something like that and and you see yourself in it and you realize how ugly it can be. Suddenly, real life mean girls were all the rage on TV talk shows. Lindsay and I did the Dr. Phil show together and we watched um, some girls that they had brought in to the show be really horrible to each other. And it was, um, it was an amazing example of how nasty and how mean girls can be. It's, it's scary high school. It's getting worse. People are getting meaner. Technology makes it so much worse, and parents give their kids cell phones. You cannot go home and escape from people being nasty because technology makes it ever-present. Hollywood wasn't immune to mean girl syndrome either. All over town, the claws came out. I don't think Hollywood is very much different than high school because a lot of the young women who start out at a very young age and develop these social cliques, and of course the cliques have to fight with one another. Should we wait for Paris? In April 2005, Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie publicly announced the end of their friendship. The rift split up the celebrity party scene. Starlets chose sides and helped perpetuate the gossip. Nicole and Paris loved having their lives played out in the tabloids. By summer 2006, Paris and Nicole made up, but the drama wasn't over. In June, according to press reports, a spat erupted between Hilton and Lindsay Lohan after Paris learned Lindsay was hanging out with one of her exes. The girls claimed to be friends, and Hilton's camp said there was no battle. Still, the paparazzi went wild. Lindsay and Paris are the two best people at working that landscape. They both have to make out with each other's ex-boyfriends, or at least the ex-boyfriends of the best friends of the girls they hate. By fall, the two were photographed hanging out together. 
But the feud helped cement Lowen's reputation as a party girl. She didn't go to high school, so in a way she gets to kind of play out the cocktail party scene of Los Angeles with proper actually shooting it. <laughs> so, but it's not like she's doing anything out of the ordinary or anything you know necessarily evil. It's just that she's just kind of doing what girls that age do and doing it with a higher profile. I think the toughest part is like everyone's watching you ten times closer. You're under a microscope, so it's like you have to be that much more careful. Lindsay is a mega talent, and I think it's tragic that the press finds it necessary to dig up dirt on anybody who becomes a big star. The minute you're a star, you're a target. While drama seemed to be Lindsay's middle name, her Mean Girls co-star steered clear of gossip. Lacey Chabert and Amanda Zeifried were too busy taking advantage of their success. Lacey's had a huge voiceover career. She has several films, some independent films, some TV stuff. Amanda was in two TV series. She was in uh, Veronica Mars and in Big Love. So she's doing real well. And she, she's a young girl. She's like 21 years old. So she's got a lot ahead of her. A couple of months after the release of Mean Girls, Rachel McAdams scored big with The Notebook. Convincing work in two contrasting roles shot McAdams to the top of the A-list. Rachel really took off after that and was seen in a legitimate hit. Her career just exploded. Rachel continued to prove her versatility in a string of diverse films, including the comedies Wedding Crashers and The Family Stone, and the thriller Red Eye. She's definitely got like this great movie star quality. She's very watchable and very engaging on screen. Yet at the same time, she's very serious about her work. She wants to kind of raise her game so that she's playing with the heavyweights of acting. Meanwhile, Tina Fey's legacy was already part of television history. Tina helped bring back uh, smart comedy uh, to SNL that, you know, given time to sort of grow, will become legendary. Faye took a break in September 2005 to give birth to her first child, Alice Zabobia Richmond. But a month later, Tina returned to NBC Studios. Well, you know, having a new baby, and then she went back pretty early to SNL, and uh, I'm sure that was difficult, but, you know, she got a very supportive husband, so they've made it work. You know, she's a working mom. Tina plotted her next move. In 2006, she both produced and starred in a pilot for NBC called 30 Rock. With 30 Rock, Tina's creating this cast and ensemble group of players, some who come from Second City and some who don't. So that improv training that she, you know, started at Second City is vital to her success now. When the sitcom got picked up, Faye announced that after nine years, she was leaving SNL. Well, I'm sure it was a very hard decision, but, you know, at the same time, she'd been there for quite a while. Because, you've, you know, so you've got a sense of a family and you're saying goodbye to Saturday Night Live is always a bit of a, a tough time. But Tina capitalized on her SNL experience. She based her new show on her old job. The move paid off. I love 30 Rock, and I'm really glad to see the show on the air because it has the same sensibility and the same sort of punch in the gut, knock the wind out of you, sense of humor that Mean Girls had. Tina Fey and her band of Mean Girls took an ordinary slice of American life and spun it into Hollywood gold. The message of their movie may be simple, but it continues to ring true like the golden rule. It's just, you know, just you gotta kind of be nice to each other. Just to be yourself and not change for other people to like you. Stay out of drama, don't get involved in drama. And just have fun. Girls and women, sometimes we're our own worst enemies and we don't have to be that way. We don't have to do that to each other.